I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers, and I want to thank you for being with us today on this program. Our show, Christian Answers, usually deals with different theological topics and comparative religions. And today we're dealing with an interesting subject on the religion of Islam. The title of our sh series that we're doing right now is called Answering Islamic Apologists. Now, Islamic apologists are guys that uh, are arguing for the reasons why their religion is true and basically other religions aren't true. And they're trying to give you reasons why their religion is superior to other religions and they're at the same time trying to say how their religion is true and they try to defend against attacks against their religion. And so we're going to deal uh, here on Christian Answers with this particular topic today. We're dealing uh, with Islamic apologists. I am uh, basically keying this whole series on this set of tapes. There's several of them. I've already shown in show number one. We've got album after album of these tapes by Dr. Jamal Badawi of the Islamic Information Center out of Canada. And we're dealing with his arguments and tapes. We do have some other Islamic apologists as well we'll be dealing with in this series. But we're trying to uh, analyze what they say and then also argue from a Christian perspective. And we're going to see where the truth lies. Because after all, in the end, it's truth that matters. Not just what I say or this guy over here says or whatever. It's the truth, and that's what we're trying to get at. And in this program, I'm joined by a very special guest of mine, our director of research, Steve Morrison. Great to have you here, Steve. Well, thank you, Larry. And uh, we've already done one show on Dr. Badawi, and we're getting ready to move on into the, the second show, dealing with his apologetics on why Islam is true, basically why Christianity is false, mm -hmm. and we as representatives of cr the Christian point of view are going to try to you know, answer some of these uh, arguments by Dr. Badawi from his Islamic perspective and for the, hopefully for the benefit of our viewers, either Muslim or Christians. We are not against, uh, you know, we don't hate Muslims. We don't hate Hindus. We don't hate anybody out there. We, we want to share the love of Christ with all fellows because that's what uh, Jesus said to do, you know, Amen. to love our fellow man. So we do this in a spirit of love, love not of hate. And, of course, also because we, we love Christ, it, it kind of hurts us in the heart when there's other people out there, particularly of other uh, religious persuasions, that are attacking him as we perceive it, attacking Christ and what he stands for. And so we feel like it's our Christian duty to, uh, you know, to answer those arguments. And in fact, we're told to do that in First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Give to every man an answer for the hope that lies within you. Mm -hmm. uh, it says in Titus 1, 9, to refute those who contradict and have you know, a different doctrine. Uh, throughout the scriptures, it says that we're to, you know, come boldly and, and 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 stand for Christ, not be ashamed of Christ, but stand up for Christ, and rebuke, exhort, uh, and correct those who would uh, come with other ideas and, and doctrines. And so, actually, we're following the biblical command uh, in this particular series dealing with Islamic apologists. So, with that said, I'd like to mention that this is show number two, and in our last show. We left off uh, with tape number five, or actually tape number six in Badawi's series, his, his first tape set we're dealing with. Uh, but we left a couple loose ends. We're going to clean those up now and then continue to move through his tapes. Uh, in the last show, we were in his, on his tape five. He had mentioned the sinlessness of the prophets and how he didn't like what the Bible said about uh, Abraham and Adam and Moses and, and uh, you know, some of the other uh, Bible characters. He, he didn't like what uh, the Bible said about them, uh, Solomon's, you know, and so forth, because it mentioned some of their sins, some of their failings. And uh, Badawi is saying that, well, you know, these prophets of God, they don't, they don't sin like that. They lead good, excellent lives. They may have little tiny little problems, but nothing major like the Bible reports. And so he's basically saying all the Bible stories about Abraham and Moses and Solomon and so forth were wrong because they showed the sins of these particular biblical characters. And so what we're going to do is, in this particular program is deal with the sinlessness of the prophets of Islam. In Islam, they think all these prophets, either it's, if, it's, if it's Adam or if it's uh, Solomon or Moses, they, they, 
they uh, Jonah. They didn't, Jonah Abraham. They didn't. They didn't commit any any real big sins or anything. They didn't commit any, any sins at all. Right. Uh, according to modern Muslim teaching. Yeah. Well, basically, what I got from uh, uh, Badawi's teachings there, he he mentions there might be something some sins of uh, omission and commission that are so minor as to be almost not even be considered sins because mm-hmm. uh, he said the only really sinless one is Allah so as human beings we have our frailties and our little problems but uh, as far as these kind of sins mentioned in the Bible no way he says mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're like sinless in that sense so he has a, a, a definition of sinlessness that doesn't actually mean sinlessness like a Christian would look at it in the life of Christ as being totally without sin. His idea of sinlessness is more in a sense of sinlessness uh, where they don't really commit any major sins, but there might be some tiny little things that are so minuscule as to almost not be noticed. Kind of a, a, a modified or, or toned down sinlessness right, or right. near sinlessness. And that's why he can, uh, you know, because he affirms in his tapes over and over again that Jesus was not sinlessly perfect. He was just like the other sinless prophets of the Bible. And then he would work himself to bring Jesus down to that level of these other prophets of their sinlessness. But uh, what we're going to do here to start this show is look into this whole idea of uh, the sinlessness of the prophets of Islam. And uh, if our viewers are watching, and I'm going to let Steve jump in wherever he wants to, I'm going to just get into this right away here and have you look for yourselves and analyze this. You'll see on your screen different things coming up as I talk about it. But we're, let's, let's start with some of these prophets of Islam. You know the Muslims have 124,000 prophets. And uh, of these prophets, there's some that are greater prophets than other prophets. But one of their great prophets is Adam. And uh, they say, what, is it, what does it say about Adam in the Quran? We're going to go to the Islamic sources and uh, see for ourselves what we're, what we're looking at here. We'll also uh, get into what the Bible talks about these prophets as well. But what we get from the Muslim apologists, such as Dr. Badawi, is that these prophets, like Adam and these others we're going to give you, didn't really commit any sins. They're like sinless, but they might have had some little problems. Uh, but as far as they're concerned, these guys are basically sinless. Not maybe sinlessly perfect, but they're sinless in some sort of sense that they're trying to argue for. And so, let's look at Adam in the Quran. And if you see on your screen there, we have Surah, chapter 20, verses 120 and 121. What does it say? It says, But Satan whispered evil to him, talking about Adam, and you'll see that right away. He said, this is Satan talking to Adam, O Adam, in the result, they both ate of the tree. Thus did Adam disobey, period. That's in the Quran, and that's Surah 20, 120, and 121. Then we look at another Quranic verse, that's Surah 2, 26. And uh, here it says that it is truth from their Lord. But those who reject faith say, what means God by this similitude? By it he causes many to stray, and many he leads into the right path. But he causes not to stray except those who forsake the path. And you have to, when you look at that, you kind of wonder, uh, was Adam forgetful up here in that last verse we looked at? Or did Adam forsake the path that God had given him when it came to the things that, of the tree in the Garden of Eden? Now let's look at this next uh, surah. Surah 7, 19 through 23. It says, Adam, and then there's a, an ellipsis, approach not this tree, or ye run into harm and transgression. So by deceit, he, that would be talking about Satan, brought about their fall. Their shame became manifest. And they said, that would be Adam and Eve, we have wronged our own souls, end quote. And uh, if you need a cross-reference to that, in the Al-Bukhari Hadith, volume 6, verse 3, it says, Adam will remember his sin, period. Just wanted to get a little stress on that. You know. Adam will remember his sin. Now, uh, let me turn to my brother here who's been sitting patiently. The viewers at home just read all these for themselves on the screen. Uh, what does this look like from these Quranic texts and a little backup from the Hadith? All right, well, it looks like that the, the Adam sinned, and so if you say he sinned lust, but he sinned, 
then it looks like Badawi, you know, on the surface, you'd think he doesn't believe the Quran. That's right. Because the Quran says, and, and let's say you have a Muslim who hasn't read the Hadith and hasn't read the Quran. It's like, well, he, he could figure this out. It's not that difficult. If, if mankind fell, you know, with, with Adam and Eve, um, then, and, and if they, if you define Adam and Eve as a prophet, which, well, Adam is a prophet, which, which Islam <coughs> uh, mentions him as a prophet, then it's like, okay, well, then prophets have to sin. Otherwise, everybody must be sinlessly perfect because man never fell. Right. And like I said before, Badawi goes through a lot of trouble to try to say the sinlessness of his prophets doesn't actually mean total, complete, perfect sinlessness. Uh, he, he goes into this sense of sinlessness, but as we can see here, uh, even by that definition, it looks clearly from the, the Islamic sources that Adam was a sinner. And how you can say he's sinless, and he has a sinlessness, just no matter how you want to define that term, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's all I'm saying. I'm just looking at this logically. I mean, just look. It's just he, he, he sinned. He disobeyed. He shamed his own soul. I mean, how I mean, how obvious can he get? Now let's go to the next uh, Bible prophet or Islamic prophet, as they like to say, going to the Quran on Noah. What about Noah? He's another. He's considered another great prophet of Islam, and one of these sinless prophets that the Muslim apologists talk about. Well, in Surah 11, verses 45 through 47, it says, Noah called upon his Lord and said, O oh my Lord, surely my son is of my family. And then there's an ellipsis. He said, O oh Noah, he is not of thy family, for his conduct is unrighteous. So ask not of me. Noah said, O oh my Lord, I do seek refuge with thee, lest I ask thee, for that of which I have no knowledge, and unless thou forgive me and have mercy on me, I should indeed be lost. Okay, now, now it's still on the screen there, folks. You're looking right at it. Now, I want you to notice right down there at the bottom. See, uh, notice uh, Noah says, forgive me and have mercy on me. I should indeed be lost. But why is he saying that? If you keep looking at it, it goes back up there. It's because Noah's asking, if you see in this passage, he's asking that his son get a break, basically. But then God says, no, he's not going to get a break because his conduct is unrighteous. <laughs> and you shouldn't be asking for this. And then Noah realizes his mistake, that he shouldn't have asked God to give his son a break. And, uh, and then he's so worried about it, he says, forgive me for this. I, I, I've blown it. I shouldn't have done this. Have mercy on me. And uh, or else, you know, I'll be lost if you don't forgive me for this. I'll be lost. I mean, to me, once again, let me get my brother in here on this. Once again, it looks like uh, a prophet of Islam has blown it. Yep. Uh, uh, Muslims as well as Christians would agree that Noah was a prophet, and if Noah wasn't sinless, and therefore all the prophets are not sinless, and then therefore there's no reason for saying if Muhammad was sinless, since there's no statement in the Quran. See, since there's no statement that says specifically Muhammad was sinless, the only hope they have to support him being sinless is by saying all the prophets were. Right. So even right. a prophet like Noah basically blows out of the water. So basically what you're saying, this whole idea that the Muslim apologists come up with that all the prophets are sinless is, is simply a ploy to try to bring their prophets, including Muhammad, right. up to the level of Jesus, That's right. who they know was sinless. From all accounts, and we'll get into that in a little while. Okay, let's go back to our, our, our screen here, into the Quran. And as you're looking on at home, you can see, now we're going to talk about Moses. And we're looking in the Quran. And we're looking at Surah 28, verses 15 and 16. Quoting, Moses struck him with his fist and made an end of him. He said, this is a work of evil. In parentheses from the Yusuf Ali translation, Satan. And then he says, uh, ellipsis, he prayed, O oh my Lord, I have indeed wronged my soul. This is Moses talking. Do thou then forgive me? He asks a question. And then it goes on to say, So God forgave him. So what we have here is a story about Moses. He, struck, he strikes this Egyptian and he kills him. And now he's all worried about killing this guy. And he asks God, he, uh, You know, uh, indeed I've wronged my soul for killing this guy. Will you forgive me for it? He, Steve, it just looks like he's asking forgiveness. He feels like he's done something wrong. Mm -hmm. He has sinned. 
And he's asking God to forgive him for this sin. Right. And what the Quran says about Moses killing an Egyptian, this is prior to leading the Israelites out of Egypt, is actually very similar to what the Bible says. And of course, Moses was in the wilderness in Midian, hiding from Pharaoh, basically, you know, for 40 years after that. But uh, he did something wrong. And it's like, okay, so if you say he's, uh, he's sinless, but he still does things wrong, then you basically gutted the definition of the word sinless. Exactly. Exactly. That's... Keep that in mind, folks. Okay, let's go to our next prophet of Islam, one of these sinless prophets that the Muslims are always talking about, Jonah. Or in the, uh, in the uh, Quranic text, it would be uh, Zunan, I guess would be the proper pronunciation. Okay, Surah 2187. The, the Quran says, And remember Zunan, when he departed in wrath, he cried through the depths of darkness, There is no God but thou. Glory to thee. I was indeed wrong. Now let's go right away to the next surah in the Quran, which also uh, ties in with Jonah or Zunan in this case. Verse 37, 142. It says, Then the big fish did swallow him, and he had done acts worthy of blame. End quote. Okay, so the viewers there can see for themselves Jonah admits he's, he was indeed wrong. I was indeed wrong. And then in another part in the Quran, it says that Jonah had done acts worthy of blame. Now, to me, that looks perfectly clear like he sinned. Jonah sinned, according to the Quran. And yet, the Muslims today, and these Muslim apologists like Dr. Badawi, I'm sure, and these other people, uh, they say he's a sinless prophet. And he's just as sinless as Jesus or any of the rest of them. Steve, any comment or should I? Uh, well, and I, I was trying to see how, how Yusuf Ali in his footnotes, how he would handle this. And he basically has no problem with it at all. At, uh, after mentioning there are some huge fishes and he thinks, you know, mentions crocodile and huge fish in the Tigris River, which uh, I don't believe that, but that's his view. And, and, and it says in his footnote, uh, 4125, and, uh, it says, This was to be the burial and grave of Jonah inside the big fish. If he had not repented, he could not have gotten out of the body of the creature that had swallowed him until the day of the resurrection when all the dead would be raised up. So Yusuf Ali, who is not holding to the sinlessness of Jonah in this case, said that he had to repent. So are you sinless, but you still got to repent? You know, again, that's just eviscerating the, the, uh, the, the idea of sinless. And it, yeah, and it destroys the whole idea. What is sinless? If, if this isn't a sin or any of these guys we've mentioned so far are not sinning, then what is sin? You know? Right. Okay, let's go on to our next prophet of Islam. Now, this one's a big one. This is a really big prophet of Islam. In fact, the, uh, over there in Mecca at the Kaaba, uh, they've got all these shrines and rituals dedicated to Abraham, the prophet Abraham. So let's see what the Quran says about the prophet Abraham. Surah 26, 82. It says, Abraham speaking, And who, I hope, will forgive me my faults on the day of judgment? End quote. Here you have it. You're looking at it on your screen, folks. You can see it right there. This is Abraham talking in the Quran, and he's talking to God, talking about God, who, I hope, will forgive me my faults. He couldn't be really be talking to anybody else. He's got to be talking about God, and he's got to be talking about to God about his faults. And faults obviously are sins because if they weren't really sins, why do you need to ask forgiveness for them? You know, it, what do you have to say about that, Steve? To me, it looks like a fault is a sin, and to say it's something else wouldn't make any sense. Right. Uh, John Gilchrist, in some of his tapes, uh, he has a tape on, on the uh, sin, sinlessness of, or sinfulness of the prophets and Muhammad and the sinlessness of Christ, and, and, and some of this uh, material you know, came from there. Uh, he, uh, <clears throat> he basically shows that there, the, the, the Arab cognate, the, the consonants used in this word, and of course the Quran was written with just consonants originally, um, if the only place that is used, it refers to something having to do with a sin or something wrong. So you could say this word translated fault, it you know, could be fault, sin, transgression. That, you know, that there might be some uh, variation there, but regardless, it's something that, 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 that needs forgiving for. Right. And, 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 and so to say, well, I don't have sins, I just have a lot of stuff that, I, that needs forgiving for. It's like, um, well, then why are you just playing with words, you know? 
because it, it guts the meaning right. of the words themselves and blows out the context of what the Quran is telling us. Because mm -hmm. if you can make uh, faults or asking for forgiveness into anything else that's not really a sin, and then you don't don't really need forgiveness for it. Because right. if it's not a sin, you, why do you need forgiveness? It would be a sin then to ask for forgiveness for something that's not needing forgiveness for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can't win either way going on going this route. Okay, let's go. Let's go to. Uh, uh, another prophet of Islam, you may have heard of this one, <laughs> Muhammad. What about Muhammad? I, I think he's known in the Islamic world as a prophet. Does it was prophet as, just as sinless as Jesus, as they say? Well, let's take a look in the Quran, Surah 48, verses 1 and 2. It says, "Lo, we have given thee, O Muhammad, signal victory, that Allah may forgive thee of thy sin." that which is past and that which is to come and may perfect his favor unto thee and guide thee on the right path, end quote. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but just keep looking at it on your screen there. It says uh, that Allah may forgive thee of thy sin, basically your past, present, and future sins as you go on in that text. He wants forgiveness for all these sins, and I think that's clear enough. But now there may be Muslim apologists would argue, no, it doesn't mean that. Blah, blah. But anyway, let's go on to another Quranic text and see if we can get some real context to all this. Surah 40, 55. Patiently then, persevere. For the promise of God is true. And ask forgiveness for thy fault. So here we go again, Steve. We got a fault of, uh, of the prophet here mentioned uh, in that next... Uh, Surah, Surah 40, verse 55, about Muhammad. All right. I, I, I once asked a Muslim about uh, 4055, and what he said uh, is that he thought that that word shouldn't be fault, but it should be frailty. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's follow that path for a second. All right. So if Allah made somebody frail, maybe, you know, you're, you're frail physically, or, or, or you tire easily, or you have some physical sickness, or, or there's something that's frail about your physical or emotional whatever makeup. Mm -hmm. So, but it's not a sin, it's not something you had responsibility for, not something that you did wrong, then you're asking forgiveness for how Allah made you? That, that path seems to go into a blind end there. That's right. So, so whatever, whatever you say about that word, um, that's something that we need forgiveness for. Now, we need forgiveness for things that we're responsible for. Now, of course, not just things we do, but, thing, but good things that we fail to do, as well as, well as say, and as, as well attitudes of our heart. But Muhammad needed forgiveness. That's right. That's and, right. And, and Jesus needed no forgiveness. Now, I'm sure there's still Muslims out there who would disagree with this, but what's interesting, too, and I've got a... Uh, you know, I've got a Yusuf Ali translation right here with me, 1977 edition. But uh, a footnote to that surah there, uh, Ali, in a, his translation and commentary, uh, says on page 1277, footnote 4428, says, Every mortal, according to his nature and degree of spiritual enlightenment, enlightenment falls short of the perfect standard of God. And he also references that point to surah 1661. And should therefore ask God for forgiveness. So he's already saying every mortal, right. of which Muhammad would be one, uh, you know, falls short of the perfect standard of God. And then uh, we also can look at Surah 18, 110, which says Muhammad was just a mortal man. And he says, Muhammad there in, in Surah 18 says, I, I am a man like yourselves i am but a man like yourselves okay so we know yeah. muhammad's mortal according to the quran and here here's this muslim commentator kind of goes along with this point about how even muhammad being immortal falls short of the standard of god and has to uh, you know seek forgiveness now if that's not enough there'll still be muslims that won't accept even a muslim commentator mm -hmm. uh what about the Hadiths? Now, of course, I know the Shiites probably won't pay much attention, so they're just stuck with all these references we gave from the, the Quran, which I think are positive proof. But if you need more, let's go to the Hadiths. So maybe uh, uh, you have some uh, uh, re reliability on like the Al-Bakari Hadiths. Well, in Al-Bakari Hadith, Volume 1, 19, it says, O oh, Allah's Apostle, we are not like you, Allah has forgiven your past and future sins. End quote. He's forgiven, and it says right there, sins. Mm -hmm. S-I-N-S. -S. 
He has forgiven your past and future sins. And uh, I don't think there's any way out of that one. Now let's look at the next one. Bukhari Hadith, Volume 1, 744, or 711. O oh Allah, set me apart from my sins. In parentheses it says faults. <laughs> so now we have the Hadith verifying that a fault is a sin, like we mentioned before. Okay. He says, cleanse me from my sins. This is Muhammad talking. He says, wash off my sins. Uh, so you've got basically set me apart from my sins, cleanse me from my sins, wash off my sins. So Muhammad apparently thinks he's got sins. Bakari Hadith, Volume 1, 781. Oh Allah, forgive me. Bakari Hadith, Volume 8, 319. Narrated Aku Herrera. I heard Allah's apostle saying, By Allah, I ask for Allah's forgiveness and turn to him to repentance more than 70 times a day. So 70 times a day, Muhammad had to ask for forgiveness. If you remember Yusuf Ali's narration of a minute ago, he's asking for forgiveness of sins because he falls short of the standard of God. So that's actually, he must have been committing quite a few sins to, uh, to be committing 70 sins a day. But anyway. Yeah, 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 just saying, how many times, no, he asked forgiveness. Forgiveness, it's, 70, 70 times, times a day. A day so, so how many times is that an hour divided by 24? <laughs> well, that's right, that's like, quite a bit. So he must have really felt guilty. Yeah, I mean, of course, he probably, we don't know if he did when he was sleeping or not, but so it's like, he must have spent all his time doing that. How did yeah. he have time to conquer anywhere? That, that, <laughs> that, that's, that's a good point. But that's what it says in the Al-Bakari Hadith, uh, 8, uh, uh, 319, but also in that same volume, 8407, it says, uh, forgive me my sins, forgive my mistakes, those done intentionally, or out of ignorance, or with seriousness. Forgive my sins of the past and of the future, which I did openly or secretly. Okay. And that's Muhammad again, and he's, he's, he's rightly admitting that he's either done open sins or he's done secret sins, and either intentional sins, he's admitting he's done that, mm -hmm. or whatever. But I don't know how much more of a confession you need to, to see that this guy is saying, I'm a sinner. Yeah. I am a sinner, and I need forgiveness. And you can also see in the Musa, uh, that's another hadith. Uh, how do you pronounce that, Steve? Ashari? Ashari, yeah. Ashari. Musa Ashari, page 809. Muhammad was a sinner, and on page 768, every son of Adam is a sinner. So on another hadith, we have those uh, statements right there. So I think it's pretty clear from Islamic teaching mm -hmm. and Quranic teaching that Muhammad was a sinner. And now, it's a curious little phrase there, every son of Adam is a sinner. All right, well, uh, Muslims, the, the Quran does show that Jesus was not a sinner, but the, the Quran also establishes that Jesus was born of, of a virgin. So mm -hmm. in that sense, he's not a son of Adam, you know, at least on his father's side. But Muhammad, Christians and Muslims agree, he was born, you know, in the normal manner of things. And so if every son of Adam's a sinner, then, he, then Muhammad's a sinner too. That's right. But I think Muhammad is worthy to be believed here. He spent so much time talking about yeah. being a sinner and asking for forgiveness. I think we can believe Muhammad in these hadiths when he says he was a sinner and he had to ask forgiveness 70 times a day. And it's also an interesting note here that many people may not realize that, you know, whenever you tell lies, the problem with a lie is that because it doesn't fit with reality and it doesn't fit with the truth, you always have to kind of bend over backwards to... Uh, to try to make that lie look plausible. And it grows. You, you, yeah, and it, lies are really hard to substantiate when reality and truth, you know, stick up their ugly heads and make that mm -hmm. lie look what it really is. Well, what I found Muslim apologists try to do, especially when they're confronted with these unfortunate hadiths and, and Quranic verses, is they try to say, well, they, they, they can't deal with the sin part too much, so they're going to try to go with the forgiveness of sins. And they're going to, and they try to say, well, that word forgiveness doesn't really mean forgiveness of sins. What it really means is protection. And this is a big oh. Islamic uh, argument that uh, when they're asking for forgiveness, they're not really asking for forgiveness of sins. They're asking for protection from God. So, and so they're making their argument that so that's what forgiveness means. Okay. Right, that's exactly what they, they argue. But when you, uh, you, you... You know what that reminds me of? Is there are some Sufi groups that when they read the Quran, there are certain words that they believe have a little different meaning than, I guess, 
most Arabs would commonly think and, and, and the Sunnis would believe. And so it's like they just put their own meanings in. Right. right. And, and, and Christian cults, by the way, they sometimes do the same to the Bible. So it's not unique to Islam. But well, do you see, you see the problem when you're telling a lie and you're trying to get out of something, you have to go to extreme lengths that are really aren't plausible because mm -hmm. a lie just doesn't hold up when you analyze it with the truth. And to say that the word protection is what really is meant in all these chronic verses and things that say forgiveness is in itself a lie, I would mm -hmm. argue, because they're just trying to escape the truth of the sinlessness, that the, the sinlessness of the prophets of Islam is not true. And when you look at Surah 40, verse 7, it refutes the contention, uh, uh, that contention right there from the Arabic. Now, I ask anyone that knows Arabic to check out Surah verse 40, verse 7, because uh, you, have inter you have differing words in Arabic, some that mean forgiveness and some that mean protection. So even in the very language, you have a difference in, difference in role and meanings by the different words used in the Arabic. Uh, the Arabic language itself does not allow for this interpretation of protection. Uh, how do you ask for protection from sins committed in the past? Like Surah 48.2 says, as, uh, as Muhammad is asking for in that, that we already read. So if it means protection, how can, how can uh, Muhammad ask for something that was committed in the past for protection from something that's already happened? Right. And it and, doesn't make any sense. And, 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 and Surah 47, in Yusuf Ali's translation in English, uh, he has for, forgiveness and then later on down he says, forgive then those who turn in repentance. So I would say, okay, so it's, it's protection for those who turn in repentance. Well, then basically there is no word for, for forgiveness if, if, right. if you're going with that argument because what do you do when you turn in repentance? You know, if Allah gives you whatever that is, that's what we're talking about. That's right. And what you, another problem that they have using this argument is in Surah 59, verse 23, one of the names of Allah is protector. And once again, I, I point you to the Arabic language and the plain meaning of the language. There's no way they can argue this point about forgiveness meaning protection because those are different Arabic words. Uh, and, uh, uh, forgiver, if I remember right, is, is also another name of, uh, of Allah. So it's like, so you mean those two names are really only one name? You know. <laughs> exactly. And it's like I said, a, a truth under uh, a lie under the microscope of truth just doesn't hold up. Mm -hmm. Now it may seem plausible if no one wants to check into it, but. I hope from this uh, presentation that no one will make that mistake. I think what we're finding here is Muslim apologists willingly and knowingly try to escape what the Quran and the Hadith clearly teach. Mm -hmm. Because they're, the bottom line is they're trying to escape the fact that Muhammad was a sinner, and so were all these other prophets, and Jesus is way above that, mm -hmm. which would make Jesus superior to Muhammad. And that's the whole reason they come up with this stuff, about the sinlessness of the prophets, to escape the impact of Jesus being the sinless prophet, which would automatically make him superior to Muhammad or anyone else. So anyway, let's go on in this, uh, this study. The Quran uh, says uh, Jesus was blameless, pure, holy, and faultless, according to the Arabic language. And, we agree and how with that. do we know that? <laughs> yeah. Now, how do we know that? Well, here it is on the screen. Surah 1919. It says, he said, Nay, I am only a messenger from thy Lord to announce to thee the gift of a holy son. This is talking to, about the Virgin Mary, and she's going to have a holy son. And when you look at that Arabic word there, its, it's meaning translates from the Arabic either to blameless, pure, holy, or faultless. But the, the, the purest meaning of it, and it depends on your different translators from the Arabic, is blameless. Yeah, Yusuf Ali says pure, but still right. that's pretty close. But still, uh, you're getting the idea here. So here's a son that's born. He, as he's born, he's already holy mm -hmm. or pure or blameless or faultless. Okay, we look in the, the next point. The word here for holy is used in only one other place in the Quran, and that is in Surah 1874 where Moses says, Hast thou slain an innocent person? Notice the word innocent. In context, the word for innocent means blameless or not committed a crime, end quote. Likewise, the meaning is the same of Jesus in Surah 1919. Let's go to the Hadiths. Sahith al-Bakari, volume 4, 506 says, Narrated Abu Harar, 
The prophet said, when any human being is born, Satan touches him at both sides of the body with his two fingers, except Jesus, the son of Mary, whom Satan tried to touch, but failed, for he touched the placenta instead, end quote. So here's the devil. He's able to touch all these people, but he wasn't able to touch Jesus at all. The closest he got was a placenta, but that's still not Jesus. And then we go on in now, Bukhari Hadith, volume 4, 641. It says, and you can see it on your screen at home. I heard Allah's apostle saying, there is none born among the offspring of Adam, but Satan touches it. A child, therefore, cries loudly at the time of birth because of the touch of Satan, except Mary and her child. Mary Inquiry. and her child. Right. Oh. So the devil, here's why, you know, he's saying the reason... Children cry when they're born is because they're being touched by the devil. But here, the only exception to this rule is Mary and her child. The child, Jesus, was not touched. And uh, by deduction, you can figure he, 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 he didn't cry either. Right. But, but here, the devil couldn't touch him. Right. Now, 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 now some Muslims say that not only was Jesus sinless, but Mary was, Jesus, Mary was sinless also because, you know, how could a, 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 you know, a sinless prophet come from a sinful woman? Like, okay, well, if that's true, then how could a sinless person like Mary come from a sinful mother? So it's like, then her mother have to be sinless, and everybody have to be sinless, all the way back to Eve. So that argument, that, you know, doesn't hold up. That's right, that's right. And also, another thing that people have to realize is that uh, the early Muslim writers, is uh, Steve's documented a lot of our video shows on Islam in the past, you have early Muslim biographers, early Muslim writers that live closer to the time of Muhammad than these modern writers and apologists do today. But even in early Muslim writings, they attributed, they, they, they testified to the sinlessness of Jesus. Right. And this is in actual Muslim writings, not Christian writings. And it, I, 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 I'm, I'm, as far as I'm aware, all Muslims agree that Jesus is sinless, with the exception of, in the Answering Islam, says that the Ahmadiyya. Uh, say that he's not sinless, but All right. So it's it, this this idea that Doctor Battle and these other people come up with is a late invention. Once they realize that oh, we got a real problem here. If Jesus is sinless and Muhammad's a sinner and all these other guys are sinners, like the Quran says and the Hadith say, it's going to make our prophet look bad. Yeah. We can't have Muhammad looking bad, especially against Jesus. So we got to come up with this idea that Muhammad's sinless and all these other guys are sinless so they can come up to the level of Jesus. And at the same time, they'll try to bring Jesus down a little bit because they need to get Muhammad somehow, you know, leapfrogging over Jesus so people will pay attention to Muhammad rather than Jesus. So what we're saying by all this is it's just a fabrication, a modern-day fabrication by Muslim apologists to try to escape what's really going on here, which is the sinlessness of Jesus and his superiority. Okay, let's go to the next point here in this little uh, review. What does the uh, Bible say about who Jesus is? And on your screen, you see some Bible passages. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, of Jesus Christ, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 1 John 3, 5, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he, God, hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity, infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. John chapter 8, verse 46 and 47. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Now, how many people do you know that could go around saying that? <laughs> uh, can any of you prove me guilty of sin, Jesus said? If I am telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Period. Right from the words of Jesus. So, those words from the, the Scripture clearly teach... And there's many, many, many more we could bring up that Jesus is sinless without sin. And what's amazing here, Steve, and throw anything you want here, uh, is that the Quran testifies to his sinlessness. Mm -hmm. The Hadith testified to Jesus' sinlessness. 
and the Bible testifies to his sinlessness, yet Muslim apologists refuse to acknowledge this and try to argue against their own holy book as well as the Bible. Well, many, many Muslims and many Muslim apologists, actually they will um, say that Jesus is sinless. But then, like you said earlier, it's almost like they have to leap, somehow leapfrog Muhammad over Jesus. So, I mean, Ahmadi might deny it, but, but other than that, you know, many Muslims, at least the ones that I've encountered and talked to, um, they will agree that Jesus is sinless. That's right. Now, uh, let's take a couple other points in this. If, if, if Jesus were a mere man like the Muslims and other people try to say, how could he be sinless? You know, and it, when there's, there's just something about somebody that's sinless and goes through his whole life perfectly. You kind of wonder, how can that man be just a man, mm -hmm. like the rest of us? There's something different about an individual that can go through this life and never commit a sin. And uh, that almost gives him almost like a divine quality. Because the Muslims themselves say there's no one, only God is without sin and cannot sin. And uh, by, imp by implication then, Jesus being totally without sin throughout his entire life, the implication there is he, he's God. He's God in the flesh. You've got to have something that we don't have. That's <laughs> right. Because he's not like your, every, 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 your average everyday day Joe. He's, there's something about Jesus that's different. Not even like <laughs> that, the other prophets. That's right. That's way above any other prophet. And when we go to a place like John 1.1, 1, 1, only God in the flesh could go through life and not commit a single sin. And in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. There's your scripture verses on the, on the screen. As well as Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, which says, and you can read along with me, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that, it, uh, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, how, how much more obvious can you get from just these couple of Bible references, hundreds of Bible references we could give you to substantiate what the Bible's saying, Old Testament, New Testament, about Jesus being God in the flesh, which, of course, Islam and the Quran heartily disagree with. But if Islam is true, the question has to be, why do they have to fabricate this idea about the sinlessness of the prophets? I mean, if you've got a true religion like Islam, why do you have to go and make up a doctrine like the sinlessness of the prophets, which disagrees with your own holy book mm -hmm. and your hadith? What reason could there be to come up with the sinlessness of the prophets idea uh, that violates your own holy book? If your religion is true, right, and, and and not only violates it, but you know, you're talking about an argument from silence here is that if Muslims believe, at least Sunni Muslims, that all important doctrines about God were in the Quran, then if this sinlessness of the prophets is at the very least nowhere found in the Quran, and we actually see it's contradicted in the Quran, then why do you think that this is an important doctrine? Uh, or, or, or do you teach this doctrine when it's not found nowhere in the Quran? That's right. And, and another point, Steve, is if something's true, does the truth, if they say, like the Muslim apologists say, that, the, that it's true that there's a sinlessness of the prophets, if that's true, do you need to substantiate it by lies, fabrications, and falsehoods? Mm -hmm. See, does the truth need help from lies, fabrications, and falsehoods? But we see it can't be true because the Quran already says that all these guys are sinners, but Jesus is not a sinner. Yeah, and, and, and there's a Shiite sect that basically said all of the prophets were had the divine inside them. All right, sure. and, and so it's like, well, if you can't know him substantiation, then saying they're all sinless has no more support than saying they were all part right, of God. you're just making up stuff, and who's, who's going to believe you anyway? Mm -hmm. But now Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No man comes to the Father except by me. That's John 14, 6. Jesus said he was the truth. Okay? And if he's what he says he was, then that automatically makes him greater than any other prophets, living or dead. He's it. And I think from this little example we've showed here, that it's obvious from Quranic teachings, Hadithic teachings, and the Bible teachings, that Jesus is who he said he was based on the facts, based on history, not just some Muslim apologist getting up here and making claims, or like you said, these religious groups just making statements without anything to back them up. Well, we got that in, Steve, and we were running out of time in the show, but I think that was very important to get that in, and that'll kind of stay with us for the rest of this series on Muslim apologists. Mm -hmm. But I think we have time to deal with one other loose end we left from the first show, and that's going to be a comparison uh, in battle, we brought this up on his tapes, a comparison between the Islamic heaven and the, the Christian, the biblical heaven. And uh, basically, I'd like to start out with this comparison by showing us the viewers at home. There's a, a chart on the screen from the Quran. It says, Surah 972, it says, God hath promised to believers, men and women, gardens under which rivers flow to dwell therein, and beautiful mansions and gardens of everlasting bliss, but the greatest bliss is to the good pleasure of God. That is the supreme felicity. Also in Surah 56, 10 through 14, it says, And those foremost in faith will be foremost in the hereafter. These will be, the, uh, these will be those nearest to God in gardens of bliss, a number of people uh, from those of old, and a few from these of latter times. Surah 44, 52 through 54 says, among gardens and springs, dressed in fine silk and a rich brocade, uh, brocade, these will face each other. So, and we shall join them to companions with beautiful, big, and lustrous eyes. Surah 55, 56 through 58, 72 through 74 says, In them will be maidens, chaste, restrain their glances, according to some translations, whom no man or jinn before them has touched. Then which of the favors of your Lord, uh, then which of the favors of your Lord will ye deny? Like unto rubies and coral, companions restrained as to their glances in goodly pavilions, then which of the favors of your Lord will ye deny? Surah 56, 17 through, uh, 17 through 18. Round about them will serve use of, professional, of perpetual freshness with goblets, shining beakers, and cups filled out of clear flowing fountains. Surah 47.15 Rivers of wine, a joy to those who drink. And also Surah 76.21 and Surah 83.25. Uh, what we have here, Steve, I like you make comments. I, I just read them. Okay. But maybe you can make some brief comments about what we're talking about in the Islamic heaven. All right, what you're talking about is a place that uh, sounds very sensual. Uh, you can't drink on earth, but you're going to drink, you know, drink alcohol on earth, but you're going to drink alcohol in heaven. In fact, uh, I've, I've heard that one punishment for a Muslim, you know, drinking wine on earth is that he won't be able to drink wine in heaven. It's like, hmm, that's kind of odd, you know, maybe people want heaven a little early, I guess. Um, and, and then the other thing is they have all of these virgins who are called Horis or Huris, um, to meet their every need, which maybe sound great if you're a Muslim man, maybe doesn't sound as great if you're a Muslim woman. Uh, but they talk about gardens with water. Well, the, 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 the water part and the beauty part, they got that part right. Of course, they could have got that part out of Revelation 22. Um, but, but just uh, 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 looking at what they're looking forward to, it's basically a, 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 a sensual place. It, you know, it, it sounds like... Good looking chicks all around to meet your every, every sexual desire. Uh, is what you're basically saying. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's kind of a, uh, a landscape that to a, to a Muslim living in a desert in Saudi Arabia would seem like a, a dream world, you know, rivers and, and, and plush gardens. There's lots of vegetation. It's not sand and dirt and <laughs> dry desert like you get, you know, in the land of Muhammad. So that would seem really good. So it's very physical. It's very sensual. Yeah, but but it, but it's, but it's kind of interesting what you say about landscape because I know some uh, some Muslim friends who who are from the Middle East, and they actually say that um, you know the the desert for them has a kind of a beauty, uh -huh. and, and it's like well then rather than saying that all of heaven has to have the same topology, same geography so to speak, uh, you know 
you know, the Bible simply says that heaven, it, it, you know, no eye has seen, no mind has conceived the good things it has in store for them. That's right. And so, you know, the heaven could be all kinds of different places. You know, for the Christian, it doesn't always have to be only gardens, you know. That's right, and reclining chairs, and you're sitting there with uh, these young youths coming up and serving you with goblets and mm -hmm. beakers and things of this nature. you got all these servants coming around you, mm -hmm. helping you out. It's almost like a, how a Pasha would live, you know, in a... In a, in a in one of these temples, yeah, and he's and, got all these servants coming around him, and he's he's just he's just living it up, you know. But but, but think about that for some of the Muslim caliphs, especially some of the early ones who are who are corrupt, you know, the the, the Abbasids and, and things like that. It's like, well, what do they have to look forward to in heaven that they don't already have on earth? That's right. And it That's seems right. like kind of not much. That's right. Yeah. Now, uh, with our time flying on here, I would like to get the contrast with the Islamic heaven to uh, the, the Christian, the biblical heaven. And I'll, uh, you can see on your screen now we have some biblical references. You can just kind of read along. And uh, Steve already referenced to it uh, once. Uh, Revelation chapter 22, and just reading in verse 1, it says, And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of it, streets, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were of the healing of the nations. And there shall be no longer and there shall be no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb uh, shall be in it, and his bondservants shall serve him. Verse four, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Verse five. And there shall, shall no longer be any night, and there shall not have uh, need of the, the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God shall illumine them, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now as time flies, let me go to the next verse. But just as it is written, things which eye hath not seen, and ear has not heard, and which have not entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared for those who love him. First John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. And as we know from a biblical text, Jesus did not need beautiful women around him, as John 17 and Revelation, etc., clearly show. And Jesus clearly said, no sex in the afterlife anyway, in Matthew chapter 22, verses 29 through 33. So what we have here, and Steve, you might want to comment a little bit more on it, is in the biblical text, you have this glorious place where God is our light. We're in the presence of God. And you know, all those other passages, like in Revelation 4 and 5 and so forth, mm -hmm. you got the angels going, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And uh, people are worshiping God, and it's just glorious, and it's amazing, and, and, and the bliss of being in the presence of God and in dwelling in His holiness and His righteousness. Uh, it's, you don't get this, this carnal-type atmosphere of beautiful women hanging all around me for my pleasure, and guys, little guys coming up to me and serving me with uh, you know, cups and beakers and stuff. Uh, and I've got gardens, and I'm reclining, and it's like... Hey, it's all about me. It's all about me. No, in heaven we, we, we see that we're engaged in an ongoing, continual worship of God Almighty in His presence and loving every minute of it and the bliss of that fellowship with God. But when you look at the Islamic heaven, it's like, well, I'm sitting in here and i got these women. I can get them anytime I want. and uh, I've got servants. And, 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 it's, and, it's so alien. It's so different. Yeah, it, it's sort of like, I mean, I, I, I could imagine a, a Muslim mother or father, you know, you know, telling their son that, you know, we don't want you to desire drinking now. We don't want you to desire, you know, sex with a lot of women now. Uh, we don't want you to desire all these things now, but desire them when you get to heaven. <laughs> while what, 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 what the, the Christian would say, you, you know, rather than thinking about yourself as great or thinking about yourself as nobody, uh, concentrate and think about God and what He would want you to do and praising Him. There is one other aspect, though, though that we should mention, is that in, in, in Ephesians it says that we will reign in heaven. Now, we're not going to be gods by any means, but we will reign with Christ on His throne. We won't have our own thrones, but we'll have His mm -hmm. throne. 
and it, and reigning with Christ. So we are going to do things in heaven besides you know right. uh, let, you know let loll around and just drinking wine all the time. We, we, we're going to reign with Him and and besides praise Him. Now we don't know who we're going to reign over. We don't know what else God is going to do. We know it will be great and wonderful, but um, but. You know, we're going to have a relationship. We're going to have things things to do in heaven as well as praising God who will be in the center. Well, yes, praise God for that. I want our, our viewers to understand that when it comes down to this idea of uh, the Islamic heaven and the Islamic paradise, of course, uh, we didn't even get into the uh, differences. In fact, we've got a couple of minutes here. Maybe we ought to do that before I sign this show off. We'll pick up with Dr. Badawi and his uh, apologetic, Islamic apologetic tapes in the next show in his series. But uh, just briefly, I'd like to mention the Islamic hell compared to the biblical hell is also quite different. I think, uh, of course, we're just going to summarize this, and we have plenty of information free to any of our viewers out there who uh, would like to write or call our ministry for free literature, get on our mailing list for our newsletters, things of that nature. We also have a website dealing with uh, Islam that uh, I'll have Steve tell you about in just a second. But uh, looking at this doctrine of, of hell, uh, I know that Muhammad said that most of the dwellers of hell were women. And uh, Steve, from our previous research and the research you've done, uh, did Muhammad give a reason why most of the dwellers in hell were women? Yes, according to the Bukhari Hadith, they, uh, many of them were in hell because they were ungrateful to their husbands. Okay, so uh, Muhammad puts uh, most of the dwellers of hell uh, as women. And uh, any other doctrine about hell? Yeah, w or when you say most, I think it was majority. Uh, yeah, the majority of the yeah. dwellers. The right. majority of dwellers of hell were women. Not that most women are going to hell. We don't want to mm, confuse that. He's, yeah. he's basically saying that most of the dwellers of hell are women. Right. And uh, that's an interesting contrast to the biblical doctrine of hell, which said, Jesus basically said in Matthew 7 that most people are going to hell. Don't get me wrong. And we're almost out of time here, Steve, so I don't think I'll get back to you here until okay. we sign off outside of uh, quickly mention. I will uh, mention the, the, the website we have for most. Uh, the web website is www dot muslimhope dot com all one word where, where much of the stuff in these videos uh, w you know will be found on the website that's right because we have plenty of material on this and other subjects but anyway to finish up here folks uh, the the concept of hell in Islam is so different from the concept of hell in the Bible but right away I can tell you that the biblical concept doesn't put uh, the majority of the dwellers of hell as being women. Uh, there's no there's no sexist concept there in the biblical concept as there is in Islam. But anyway, we're basically out of time. I'd like to uh, let our viewers know we have our newsletter. Uh, we have tracts and literature free of charge for those that would be interested in these things. Contact us, uh, write us, whatever, and we'll be glad to uh, help you any way we can. I'm Larry Wessels with I'm, I'm Larry Wessels with Steve Morrison for Christian Answers. Thank you for being with us, Steve. It's great to have you here again. And uh, remember what Jesus said, and we reentered it thread through. He was the sinless prophet. He was the one without sin. So why not listen to the sinless one, Jesus Christ, as opposed to all these other wicked sinners? Uh, no offense to Muhammad, but a man that has to repent 70 times a day for his sins, I would think that you might want to give more credibility to the Lord Jesus Christ who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Trust in Him, the Scripture says. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next time.